and welcome to Jesus and Tim in Las Vegas. Thank you, Warren, for helping out today. And uh, my job is to get as many gospel tracks into the hands of people coming from all over the world to the secret suicide capital of the world, Las Vegas, Nevada, where suicides are not reported here, but in the hometowns of where people came from. Because what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, but God knows, doesn't he? It's a, a joy to uh, talk, first of all, with my friend David Daniels. Uh, I love Jack Chick. Jack Chick was a dear friend of mine. I'd talk to him every day at five o'clock for a couple minutes. He'd want to know what was happening in Las Vegas. And uh, he went home to be with the Lord a couple of years ago. And uh, David Daniels had been working with him for a number of years. David, are you there? I am here. All right, brother. Thank you so much. I wanted to have you on today. Because there are people who doubt what Jesus said about hell. Uh, I didn't become a Christian because Jesus loved me. I'm motivated by that now. I got saved because of hearing about what Jesus said about hell. The topic of whether there is a hell and whether God will cast people into a lake of fire to burn for all eternity is a pretty emotional topic. Is there a way to approach this without all that emotion, David? Well, yeah, Tim, I think we need to approach this from the subject of what's God's point of view, not what's man's point of view. Um, I actually wrote about it a little bit in a tract called Limited Time Offer, and uh, Jack wrote about it in the tract called Hi There. But whether I think God should do something or not, or whether I think what God does is reasonable, is really the wrong standard. The right standard to use is what did God say he would do? What did God say are his principles? Because at the end of the day and the end of our life, only what God says really matters. He's given us ample warning, as well as his promises and scriptures. That's the key. No one is without excuse. I mean, he made his truths known. So only what God says either counts or matters. So you, you see where I'm going there? Yeah, absolutely. So we have to ask, what has God re already revealed about himself? So it's not about what I prefer. I have no say in the matter. These are God's rules. They're already set in motion, and they're not up for debate. So we should ask, then, what has God revealed him about himself? Uh, what, what other questions should we ask to learn what God said? Okay, um, how about this? Can God have righteous anger? Yes, absolutely. Psalm 711, God is angry with the wicked every day. God judges the righteous. God is angry with the wicked every day. In verse 13, it says... Psalm 713, he has also prepared for him the instruments of death. He ordained his arrows against the persecutors. And God showed Job how it was wrong to say that God was unrighteous when he judged. In Job 40, he said, Gird up thy loins now like a man, I'll demand of thee, declare thou unto me. Wilt thou also disannul my judgment? Wilt thou condemn me, that thou mayest be righteous? And in Psalm 9, 8, he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the peoples in uprightness. Romans 2, 5, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. What does perish mean? I think a lot of people are confused about that. Does it mean they're still alive all the way down to hell? Well, you know, there's a great example of that in number 16. And that's the rebellion at Korah. And God said through Moses here, if these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited at the visitation of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up with all that appertaineth to them, and they go down quick, that means alive, into the pit, then you shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And then later it says, they and all that appertaineth to them went down alive, verse 33, into the pit. And the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. So them perishing did not mean they were destroyed. It only meant they weren't in the, with the congregation of the living, as it says, anymore. Hmm. Does God have the right to expect things of his creation? Absolutely. He gives us everything. We should be grateful. Acts 17.25, Neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. In Matthew 5.45, it says, He sendeth rain upon the just and the unjust. In 1 Timothy 6.17, it says, Charge them rich that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. 
but man has not been grateful. And that's Romans 1, right? Mm -hmm. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. That was all happening because they were not thankful. Amen. We're on the phone with David Daniels from Chick Publications. Their website is chick.com. We're talking about hell. Does, does God have the right to take vengeance on those who hate him? Absolutely. He's the only one who has that right. Uh, Romans 3, 5, Paul hits it right there. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what should we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? So judging the world has to do with vengeance right there. Nahum, even, 1, 2, the prophet said, God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. In Deuteronomy 32, uh, if I wet my glittering sword and mine hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance on mine enemies and will reward them that hate me. Does God have a, a right to punish Absolutely, because when we're honest, we don't get as much punishment as we deserve. Uh, when they returned from captivity, Ezra the high priest, he caught hold of God's right to punish, and yet God still restrains. Listen to what Ezra says. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds for our, and for our great trespass, seeing that thou, our God, has punished us less than our iniquities deserve, and has given us such deliverance as this. But God still promises to punish the world for its iniquity. Isaiah 13:11, and I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. We have no right to complain, not in this life, not in the life to come. Lamentations, that's after the fall of Jerusalem, uh, God writing through Jeremiah. Where doth a living man complain, a man for the punishment of his sins? Jesus says there's going to be everlasting punishment. Matthew 25, in verse 46, he says, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Now, if anyone tries to argue the Greek with me, into, into everlasting and into eternal is the same for both. So into everlasting punishment is the same Greek as into life eternal, uh, punishment versus eternal, both, uh, life. Both are eternal. The question is, which eternity do you want, eternal mm -hmm. punishment or eternal life? And we have one choice. Is God unrighteous in anything that he does, David? Not in a single thing. In Romans 3, he says, what should we say? Is God unrighteous, as I said before, which who take his vengeance? No, or God forbid, for then shall God, how shall God judge the world? And in Hebrews 6.10, for us who follow God, God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. So God is totally righteous. He's righteous on both sides, and it never changes. Can God do anything he says he'll do? Yes, because he can deliver us from earthly fire, and he can deliver us to the fires of judgment. Daniel 3.17, for instance. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fire furnace. But Jesus also said, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather, fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Well, David, when it says destroy both soul and body in hell, doesn't that mean they'll, they'll uh, cease to exist? That's a really good question, Tim, but not at all. No, the Lord is, Jesus said soul and body that shall be destroyed, but he never said anything about the spirit being destroyed. I've checked my scriptures. There's nothing about the spirit being destroyed. I almost wonder if that's what Jesus meant when he said, their worm shall not die. Their worm shall not die. I mean, that starts in Isaiah 66, 24, last chapter of Isaiah. It says, um, and, they shall, and this is during the thousand years when Jesus is reigning and ruling, and they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed me, transgressed against me, for their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring to all flesh. So people will actually see them. Their bodies are technically carcasses, yet their worms shall not die. Hmm. And Jesus continued with this. In Mark 9, 43, remember the modern Bibles remove two of the three of the references on purpose. They, the, the people who originally were passing down these scriptures and didn't want what they said took out as much as they could. 
Mark 9, 43 to 48. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off, for it is better to thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth, their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And verse 45, again, if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Same thing as thy eye offend thee. It says, and having two eyes, verse 47, to be cast into hellfire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. There's something about their worm that has to do with them, and I think maybe that is what's left of their spirit, but their body and their soul are destroyed. Mm. Well, can God make an example of someone? Yeah, God even made an example of his own people. Uh, Deuteronomy twenty nine twenty four, when he, God is talking through Moses about what happens when they're punished, Israel is punished for our sins. It says, even all nations shall say, where hath, for hath the Lord done this unto this land? What meaneth the great heat of this, the heat of this great anger? Then men shall say, because they've forsaken the covenant of the Lord their God, of the Lord God of their fathers, which he made with them, when he brought them forth out of the land of Egypt. Talking with David Daniels from Chick Publication, talking about the eternalness of hell that Jesus warned about. Can God make uh, an eternal example, David? Yeah, but first let's agree that forever and ever is something that doesn't stop happening. Mm-hmm. So let's do this. Exodus fifteen eighteen: The Lord shall reign forever and ever. Mm-hmm. Psalm 45, 6, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Mm-hmm. But... Since people fight with the book of Revelation, let's see what's in the book of Revelation. 11.15, the seventh angel sounded, there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign, take with me, forever and ever. Hmm. Revelation 14.11, though, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So anyone receiving the mark will have no rest forever and ever. And the smoke of their torment rising up, they will have no rest day nor night. So they'll exist, they'll be in torment, they'll have no rest forever and ever. And that's the same forever and ever, if you want to do the Greek thing, that God will reign. And God will never stop reigning. So they'll never stop being tormented. Revelation 20, and the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So the beast, the false prophet, will also be tormented day and night forever and ever as long as God reigns. And that will never stop. They'll never stop being tormented. And remember, Revelation 20:14, and death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whoever is not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. So the lake of fire is for everybody who's not found written in the book of life. And it's important to point out, too, in, in Revelation 19, it says the beast and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire. And a thousand years later, in, in uh, Revelation 20, verse 10, the devil is thrown into the lake of fire where the beast and the pro- false prophet are, not were. Well, All right. Uh, if God says something, uh, if God says there's a cost to something, is there, David? Yeah, everything. Anything God says is true. In Matthew sixteen twenty six, God the Son says, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? People who don't turn in faith to the Lord Jesus will lose their own soul. He'll destroy both soul and body in hell, and their spirit that is left shall be cast into a lake of fire. If God says someone is in danger of eternal damnation, is he or she? Absolutely. Um, Matthew twelve thirty two. Whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. And Mark three twenty eight to 30, the same thing, uh, hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. It's, so to not be forgiven in the world to come means the person continues to exist in the world to come, but that person exists without forgiveness. The only place for a person to live unforgiven forever is the lake of fire. Hmm. Two more questions, David. If the fire is not quenched, will it go out? <laughs> to quench a fire means to put it out. Numbers mm-hmm. 11. The fire of the Lord burned among them uh, when God was displeased, and the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched, put, it, put out. 
Why keep a fire going forever and ever if it isn't burning anything anymore? If a fire doesn't have anything to burn, it has no reason to burn. Um, Jesus told us, their worm dieth not. The Mm -hmm. fire shall never be quenched. The place is called hell. Even yet, even hell shall be cast in the lake of fire, and the lake of fire shall never go out. Hell is real, but hell and the lake of fire can be avoided. (laughs) We don't have to perish in hell Mm -hmm. and the lake of fire forever and ever. We can have salvation. And that's where we get to the one more perish verse here. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God made eternal punishment for the devil and his angels, not for humans, Matthew 25, 41. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. You only go there if you join his rebellion against God, and you don't accept the free gift of God through faith that's offered to you. So even if a person doesn't believe in hell, or the lake of fire, or eternal punishment, all who reject Christ will experience it regardless for all eternity, as long as God reigns, Amen. ever and ever. Amen. And I tell you, if you don't have that assurance, turn to the Lord today. Say, God, forgive me for my sins. Jesus, come into my life right now. And go to chick.com and read hi there. Or uh, what was the other one that you wrote, David? The uh, un- a Limited time offer. Limited time offer. But there's some excellent, excellent uh, tracks. Right now, we're handing out uh, the trick at... Uh, schools high schools you know as they come out those kids are getting those tracks and um, nine times out of ten they're taking them david thank you so much for for being with us you have a youtube channel too don't you yeah it's easy to go to youtube.com slash uh c slash chick tracks or chick.com slash bible and that'll get you anything you need very good thank you so much david you guys are a blessing at chick publications there in rancho cucamonga greet my uh, right. my friends there god bless you I will. God bless. okay Bye-bye. take care Bye.